Good morning and welcome to the Dick's Sporting Goods fourth quarter earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Nate Gilch, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to discuss our fourth quarter 2019 results. On today's call will be Ed Stack, our Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Lauren Hobart, our President, and Lee Belitsky, our Chief Financial Officer. The playback of today's call will be archived on our Investor Relations website, located at investors.dix.com for approximately 12 months. As a reminder, we will be making forward-looking statements, including our 2020 outlook for sales and earnings, which are subject to various risks and uncertainties that could cause our actual results to differ materially from these statements. Any such statements should be considered in conjunction with cautionary statements in our earnings release and risk factor discussions in our filings with the SEC, including our last annual report on Form 10-K and cautionary statements made during this call. We assume no obligation to update any of these forward-looking statements or information. Today, we will be discussing certain fourth quarter and full year 2019 financial measures on a non-GAAP basis. We will also be comparing these non-GAAP financial measures to the comparable GAAP financial measures from the prior period because there were no non-GAAP items excluded during the prior period. We believe this comparison is helpful to evaluate the company's fourth quarter and full year performance relative to last year. Please refer to our Investor Relations website to find the reconciliation of any non-GAAP financial measures referenced in today's call. And finally, for your future scheduling purposes, we are tentatively planning to publish our first quarter 2020 earnings release before the market opens on May 27, 2020, with our subsequent earnings call at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And with that, I will now turn the call over to Ed. Thanks, Nate. Good morning, everyone. As announced earlier this morning, we had a strong 2019, and we're very pleased to deliver full-year non-GAAP earnings per diluted share of $3.69. This exceeded the high end of our guided range of $3.50 to $3.60, and represents a 14% increase over last year. For the full year, our consolidated same-store sales increased 3.7%, which also exceeded the high end of our guided range of 2.5% to a 3% increase. For the fourth quarter, we delivered a 5.3% increase in consolidated same-store sales. Our strong Q4 comps were supported by increases in both average ticket and transactions, as well as growth across each of our three primary categories of hard lines, apparel, and footwear. On a non-GAAP basis, our merchandise margin rate increased 14 basis points in the fourth quarter, reflecting a healthy business. In total, we delivered fourth quarter non-GAAP earnings per diluted share of $1.32, which represents a 23% increase over last year. It's clear our strategies are working. Our vendor relationships have never been stronger, and we have tremendous momentum with a great foundation to build on for the future. During 2019, we made meaningful changes across our business, fueling improved comp store sales results. We elevated the ethnic experience in our stores through more differentiated and premium product. We improved in-stock positions and delivered stronger merchandise presentations. We also made our stores more experiential and reallocated floor space to regionally relevant and growing categories. As we enter 2020, we remain enthusiastic about our business and are pleased with the start to our year. We will continue to focus on enhanced 2019 strategies this includes optimizing our inventory and floor space, delivering differentiated merchandising, and driving athlete engagement across all channels. Our financial outlook balances this enthusiasm with a degree of caution over the coronavirus and how it may impact our business. Lee will address our outlook in greater detail within his remarks. As I've discussed on previous calls, over the past year we have been reallocating floor space to remove Hunt and replace it with categories and products that can drive growth and better align with the needs of each market. To date, we have removed the Hunt category from 135 Dick stores 
and I'm pleased to announce these stores continue to generate positive comp sales in the fourth quarter, a noteworthy accomplishment during the peak hunting season. Building off this success, we'll remove the hunt department from approximately 440 additional Dick stores during the first half of 2020, leaving it in only 12% of our stores. As we do with all parts of our business, we will continue to monitor and evaluate all categories of business and make decisions that best serve our athletes. Additionally, we plan to build on the strong results delivered through our effective merchandising presentations. This strategy has been instrumental in the success of our premium full-serve footwear decks, among other important categories including apparel and baseball. In 2020, we plan to reconceptualize our soccer and golf businesses. We're going to follow the same playbook we used to attack the baseball category in 2019, which drove double-digit comp sales gains. We're optimistic that through more premium products, enhanced store experiences, and exceptional service, we can better serve our soccer and golf athletes and drive stronger results in these categories. Our largest and most exciting initiative this year will be focused on the female athlete, which Lauren will discuss in more detail. In closing, 2020 is an important year in which we will build on the success to fuel long-term growth and further solidify our leadership position. I'd like to thank all our teammates for their hard work and commitment this past year and for their upcoming events efforts in 2020. I would now like to turn the call over to Lauren. Thank you, Ed, and good morning, everyone. I want to start by also acknowledging the dedication and efforts of our more than 40,000 talented teammates. We've made it a priority to create an environment where passionate and skilled teammates thrive and where we recognize them for the impact they have on our business. Our strong 2019 results are directly attributable to these talented men and women who are our key differentiator and a catalyst for growth. As Ed discussed, for the fourth quarter, we delivered a 5.3% increase in consolidated same store sales, which included positive brick and mortar store comps and strong online sales growth. This performance was driven by a 2.4% increase in average ticket and a 2.9% increase in transactions. Beyond our merchandising initiatives and improved in-stock positions, our fourth quarter success is a direct reflection of our focus on improving service, experience, and marketing across all channels. And in 2020, we will build on these efforts in these areas. As you may remember, nearly one year ago, we assembled all of our store teammates across the country to roll out our new service standards. This was a landmark event for our company and a springboard from which we've developed strong momentum in our stores. This past year, our store teammates demonstrated that focusing on serving our athletes has a meaningful impact on sales. During 2020, we are excited to continue driving positive results through an improved service and selling culture, as we still see many opportunities ahead to delight our athletes. Our stores also contribute tremendously to our e-commerce growth through buy online, pick up in store, and ship from store as the lines between in-store and online are becoming increasingly seamless. During the fourth quarter, we continued to see strong Boppus growth in our Dick stores. We also expanded Boppus to each of our Golf Galaxy stores, and we're pleased with the initial response from our athletes. And for this year, Boppus grew more than twice the rate of the 16% sales growth we saw in our overall e-commerce business. Additionally, we were pleased with the performance of our two new dedicated e-commerce fulfillment centers during the peak holiday period. These new fulfillment centers, along with our new strategic delivery partnership with FedEx, have continued to reduce delivery times to our athletes. Looking ahead, we will continue to improve our omni-channel experience through faster and more reliable delivery, as well as improved functionality and performance of our website. In 2020, this will include providing shorter and more accurate estimated delivery dates earlier in the athlete's shopping funnel, expanding BOPIS to more items, and delivering more localized website experiences, as well as a faster and more convenient checkout. As part of our multifaceted women's initiative, we will deliver an expanded assortment across several key sports, including basketball, dance, soccer, and softball. In addition, our marketing in early 2020 will amplify Dix as the go-to destination for her. Last week, we launched our women's campaign featuring a TV spot that showcases the very surprising history of the sports bra and features Brandy Chastain. Additionally, we are celebrating Kalia's five-year anniversary, 
which has grown into our second largest women's athletic apparel brand. This year, we're excited to elevate the Kalia brand and assortment through new categories, more premium product, a refreshed store experience, and stronger marketing. Kalia is also integral to our broader private brand strategy. Collectively, our private brands represent our second largest brand behind only Nike and drive differentiation and exclusivity within our assortment. In addition to Kalia, we remain very enthusiastic about DSG, which we launched last year and expect to surpass Field & Stream to become our largest private brand by the end of the year. Finally, in support of our pledge to provide access to sports for 1 million additional young athletes, last year the Dix Foundation made grants of approximately $7 million to youth sports programs across the country. Importantly, this funding helps nearly 200,000 underserved kids play sports. Building on this momentum and aligning with our women's initiative, in February, Dix and the Dix Foundation hosted a Here for Her Summit in New York City, a focused effort to champion women and girls in sports and fitness. As part of this, we announced our foundation's commitment to young female athletes with a three-year, $5 million grant to the U.S. Soccer Foundation's United for Girls initiative. This grant will be used to create safe places to play, fund coaching and training opportunities, and support soccer programs in underserved communities across the country. In closing, we remain very enthusiastic about our business and confident that the continued execution of our strategies will strengthen our leadership position in the marketplace. I'll now turn the call over to Lee to review our financial results and outlook in more detail. Thank you, Lauren, and good morning, everyone. In 2019, we had a strong year from both the sales and earnings perspective. Consolidated same-store sales increased 3.7% with momentum building throughout the year. Within this, we delivered a 16% increase in our e-commerce business and posted positive brick-and-mortar store comps. On a non-GAAP basis, gross profit margin expanded 44 basis points, and as part of our focus on increasing productivity, we eliminated over $40 million of expenses across many areas of our business. We expanded non-GAAP EBT margin in the second half of the year, and for the full year, delivered non-GAAP earnings per diluted share of $3.69, a 14% increase over 2018. Now, turning to our fourth quarter results, consolidated sales increased 4.7% to approximately $2.61 billion. Consolidated same-store sales increased 5.3%, driven by growth across each of our three primary categories of hard lines, apparel, and footwear. We saw a continued strength in our stores, posting our third consecutive quarter of positive brick-and-mortar store comps. Our e-commerce sales increased 15%, and as a percent of total net sales, our online business increased to 25% compared to 23% last year. Notably, we delivered these strong sales results despite the compressed holiday selling season and challenging weather that negatively impacted sales in important cold weather categories. Additionally, as Ed mentioned, we continue to be pleased with the results of our space optimization efforts. While removal of Hunt from 125 stores contributed to a meaningful sales decline in that category, these stores come positively overall during the peak uh, Hunt selling season. On a, on a non-GAAP basis, gross profit in the fourth quarter was $746.2 million, or 28.6% of net sales, a 73 basis point improvement uh, compared to last year. This improvement was driven by leverage on occupancy costs of 62 basis points and merchandise margin rate expansion of 14 basis points. As expected, this was partially offset by costs associated with the opening of our two new dedicated e-commerce fulfillment centers. Non-GAAP FCNA expenses were $598.1 million, or 22.93% of net sales, up 77 basis points from the same period last year. 36 basis points are attributable to expense recognition associated with the change in value of our deferred comp plans resulting from the increase in overall equity markets during the fourth quarter. This expense is fully offset in other income and has no impact on earnings. The balance of the deleverage was primarily due to higher marketing expenses related to our successful multi-channel holiday campaign, as well as higher incentive compensation expenses due to our strong fourth quarter results. Driven by strong sales and gross profit margin, non-GAAP EBT was $148.6 million, 
or 5.7% of net sales, up $12.3 million, or 23 basis points from the same period last year. In total, we delivered fourth quarter non-GAAP earnings per diluted share of $1.32 compared to earnings per diluted share of $1.07 last year, which represents a 23% year-over-year increase. On a GAAP basis, our earnings per diluted share were $0.81. This included a uh, pre-tax restructuring charges of $48.8 million related to our decision to remove Hunt from over 400 stores in 2020. This includes a $35.7 million non-cash impairment of trademarks and store assets, as well as a $13.1 million write-down of Hunt inventory in these stores. For additional details on this, you can refer to the non-GAAP reconciliation tables of our press release that we issued this morning. Now, moving to inventory, as we planned, our year-end inventory levels increased 21% compared to the end of 2018. Looking ahead, our inventory is well-positioned as a result of our investments in this past year. And for 2020, we expect inventory to grow by a high single-digit rate at the end of the first quarter, with further moderation at the end of the second and third quarters. And by the end of 2020, we expect inventory levels to be approximately even with 2019. Turning to our fourth quarter capital allocation, net capital expenditures were $39 million. We paid approximately $24 million in quarterly dividends, and today announced an increase in that quarterly dividend of 13.6% to $0.31.25 cents per share, or $1.25 on an annualized basis. During the quarter, we also repurchased 759,000 shares for $36.1 million at an average price of $47.53. During the trailing four quarters, we've returned over $500 million dollars to shareholders through share repurchases and quarterly dividends. These activities were funded through cash from operations and borrowings under our revolving credit facility, and we have approximately a billion dollars remaining under our share repurchase programs. We ended the fourth quarter with approximately $69 million of cash and cash equivalents and $224 million outstanding on our $1.6 billion line of credit. Now let me move to our fiscal 2020 outlook for sales and earnings. As Ed mentioned, our outlook balances the enthusiasm we have for our business with the rapidly evolving coronavirus event. As part of this, the low end of our outlook includes some conservatism around supply chain disruption potentially impacting our sales and earnings starting in Q2. At this time, our outlook does not include an impact from slowing consumer demand should the coronavirus spread considerably in the United States. Additionally, based on what we know today, we are not forecasting any significant impact to sales or earnings in Q1. And we have been pleased with our sales trends so far this year. That said, we are actively managing our supply chain and working closely with our vendor partners to ensure the best possible outcome for our business. All this considered, for 2020, we anticipate earnings per diluted share to be in the range of $3.60 to $4, and consolidated same-store sales to be approximately flat to up 2%. EBT margin is expected to be down approximately 30 basis points at the low end of the range and up slightly at the high end when compared to non-GAAP EBT margin in 2019. Within this, gross margin rate is expected to be approximately flat at the high end, while SG&A expense is expected to leverage at both ends of the range. Our earnings guidance assumes an effective tax rate of 25.5% and is based on 85.5 million average diluted shares outstanding, which only includes the expectation of share repurchases to fully offset dilution from stock compensation plans. Net capital expenditures are expected to be in the range of 235 to $295 million. At the high end end of the range contemplates improvements in existing stores, including stronger merchandise presentations within footwear, soccer, and Kalia, as well as hunt space optimization in over 400 stores, as well as technology and store design investments to enhance the fitting and lesson experience in our Golf Galaxy stores. This also includes ongoing investments in technology, as well as nine new Dick stores, six new Golf Galaxy stores, and 17 relocations. Before concluding, 
I'll take just a moment to highlight some upcoming changes to our same-store sales reporting practices. Beginning in Q1 2020, we will continue to provide consolidated same-store sales results while moving away from providing e-commerce sales growth and e-commerce sales penetration metrics. Our athletes are increasingly shopping across multiple channels and on the same transaction, and to, to attribute the sale to one channel or the other can be quite arbitrary. We believe this single view of the consumer best represents our omni-channel approach, which centers around serving our athletes whenever, wherever, and however they want to shop. This concludes our prepared comments. Thank you for your interest in Dick Sporting Goods. Operator, you may now open the line for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the key. To withdraw your question, please press star then 2. Our first question today will come from Robbie Ohms of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Hello, this is Alex Perrion for Robbie. Uh, congrats on a great quarter. Um, just first, um, can you give us some more color on your plans for the hump business with your announcement to replace merchandise and 415 stores? I guess specifically, what categories of merchandise are you placing there? And then what type of margin uplift are you seeing as you replace hunt with other categories? Um, and then just, just last on that, um, can you give us an update on how those re-merchandise stores are performing versus chain average? Thanks. Sure. So on the categories that we're going to um, um, replace the hunt area with, depends on the store. Depends on what, uh, you know, what store the market's in and uh, categories that are most important to those stores. Um, but team sports, baseball, re, uh, re-engineering our, our soccer business um, are all parts of those uh, of those categories. Uh, we expect to increase in, in stores our uh, our youth apparel and footwear business, along with the uh, women's initiative that we've talked about. So, depending on what the store is, what part of the country, will depend on where we're what we're putting in there. And we're not going to get to a uh, um, give you such granular information of how they're performing to the rest of the chain. It was in the key hunt time, so it's difficult to compare those stores with the other stores that have already taken Hunt out. But uh, we were very pleased with the, the response we got. They count positively, and uh, as I said, we were very pleased, or we would we uh, we, we might be rethinking this whole uh, the whole idea here. Great, that's very helpful. And then just second, um, just when you say the coronavirus supply chain disruption impacting the business in the second quarter. Is there a certain category that is more likely to be disrupted? And then, I guess just offset, do you expect to have your sort of seasonal back-to-school or fall, fall 20 product on hand? And then, I think you alluded to this, but have you seen any impact to traffic trends in the U.S. yet since the outbreak? Thanks. Uh, we're very pleased with the, the start of our year, as we've indicated. Um, where some issues in the supply chain uh, may come from, we haven't seen anything significant yet, but uh, it's a pretty fluid situation, as you know. Um, so we're we're trying to be conservative of what that supply chain, uh, you know, those issues might be. But we haven't seen anything significant yet. But that doesn't mean that it can't happen because I think everybody's scrambling to see what, uh, you know, what shape their supply chain is in. It's very helpful. Best of luck going forward. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Lasser of UBS. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks a lot for taking my question, Ed. When you mention you're pleased with the start to the year, have you seen any variability in your sales by market? So if you look at the Pacific Northwest where some of the concerns have grown a little bit more intense, has, has that impacted those locations there? Surprisingly, no. It, and... Um, separately, uh, when you think about your um, the shape of the year, and I think Lee mentioned that your gross margin at the high end is expected to be flat. Um, it did appear that you had some extra seasonal clearance inventory uh, to to start the year. So, h- how should we think about how the gross margins are going to flow over the course of the year, and, and um, from a um, upside downside perspective, what? What are you factoring in at the low end in, in terms of, uh, you know, the 
the margin performance for, for each line. Just uh, earlier earlier in the year, uh, we're working through some of the hunt clearance in the 400 stores, so that should have you know kind of a modest impact on uh, unfavorable impact uh, in the first half. And we're also at the anniversary the um, two extra distribution centers in the first half of the year as well. So we'll anniversary that as we get into the third and fourth quarter. So the gross margin um, to be, a, I'd say, a little bit more pressure in the first half than in the second half. And the last question is, as you move away from the hunt category in these 440 stores, how are you going to ensure that the customer doesn't look at the exporting goods more like a department store in that you're going to skew much more heavily into the apparel and footwear categories and the differentiation may be a, a, a little bit less than it's been in the past? Uh, Michael, I, I don't think there's any concern about that whatsoever. We've... Uh, you know, we've taken it out of 140 some stores. It's real. It's out. There's some stores that we opened up didn't put it in. So there's a couple hundred stores that we don't have hunt in that we've uh, we've tested this, and we're going to be focusing on the, the female athlete, as we said. The footwear business is very strong, but we've also been very clear on our target for the uh, that high school athlete. Our baseball business. We're going to restructure our uh, our golf business, restructuring our soccer business. So I, I don't think there will be any confusion that we are in the sports and fitness business as opposed to a department store. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. Our next question comes from Kate McShane of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Um, Hi, Kate. Is, is there a way to measure what fourth quarter would have been without some of the headwinds you experienced and if you could quantify at all the, the share you were able to take? I, I'm not sure what the shares we were able to take. You can take a look at other people's comps and take a look at our comps, which were among some of the best in retail. And what it would have been had we not had some of the headwinds, you know, it's really difficult to, to uh, you know, put forth what theor theoretically that may have happened. So if the weather was colder, you know, our outerwear business would have been better, but you know, some other areas of the business might not have been as good. So it's, uh, I, I think our team did a great job managing through the uh, the uh, difficult weather pattern for our business. They did a great job from an inventory standpoint, uh, did a great job from a sales. The marketing that we put out in the fourth quarter was uh, extremely well received and differentiated and really had us stand out in the, uh, in the marketplace. And I think all of those things contributed to uh, the terrific results that we had in the fourth quarter. Kate, in, a, in addition to that, um, we made a conscious effort this year to stay in stock in uh, some of the warmer weather products throughout the chain. So our baseball business, our apparel business, um, we stayed in better stock in the footwear, in footwear position, so our inventory levels were up, but that improved inventory position allowed us to capitalize on the more favorable warm weather trends, which helped us offset some of the, the lost cold weather business. And it's also positioned us well going into Q1 from an inventory perspective. Okay, thank you. And, and then my follow-up question is just about SG&A leverage in 2020. Um, can you talk a little bit about where that's coming from? And I think in 2019 you did find some areas for cost savings. Are, are there any opportunities for cost savings in 2020, or is that included in, in the guidance? Yeah, there, there, are a few big, there are a few big chunks in, uh, SG, in SG&A. One is – um, we paid very, we're planning to pay very significant incentive compensation in 2019. And for 2020, um, we our plan is for more normalized incentive compensation. So we've got a, a pickup there. We also have the, um, kind of the evaluation of deferred comp plans. That was a significant run up in the stock market, you know, this year that we had to revalue our deferred comp plans. That gets offset in other expenses, no impact on earnings. But we'll pick up leverage on the SG&A line there. Um, I would say those those are the two biggest pieces. We're also planning to continue uh, with uh, more meaningful uh, expense savings uh, in in 2020 as well. So we've got a lot of levers uh, to pull. We've got you know structural advantages. I, I would say on on the incentive comp side as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Simon Gutman of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. 
Good morning. Um, my first question is on the top line guide zero to two, uh, which seems prudent. And, and to clarify, it sounds like that's ex corona. In other words, there's no demand impact into the zero to two. And so my question is, in which, in what scenario, um, you know, would you end up doing closer to the low end of that range, given all the good good things that are happening in the business today? So, Simeon, we did, we did bake in some. Um, uh, demand reduction related to coronavirus, but it's really related to the supply chain that, you know, potentially, you know, we may not get some of the products that we had expected to get, or we may not get them in a timely basis. So we did pull down the low end of our sales related to supply chain disruption, but we haven't pulled it down, uh, assuming that there'd be a widespread kind of demand disruption, you know, due to quarantines or isolation or whatever it may be uh, in the U.S., Got it. That, that's helpful. Did, uh, have you quantified, or can you quantify what you is it? Is it 50 bips of, of an impact? Is it a point? Uh, we 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 haven't quantified it. No worries. Okay. My follow up is these investments that you're making to the stores and assortment. Um, I, you know, you're adding premium product, and I think the mix of private label is is picking up slowly. So, so two questions to that is: Is there a naturally higher rate uh, run rate of, of gross margin, and is there some way to dimensionalize that? And then moving a little bit more to premium, you're seeing a good response. How do you feel about the balance of, of value and differentiation uh, in the store? We feel that we've got uh, uh, the right balance of between value and differentiated and premium product, which is uh, the DSG brand that we introduced last year is that more intro uh, opening price point product, a great value, great style. Um, which, as Lauren indicated in her comments, has done great, will be our largest private brand uh, um, after one year uh, th- this year. Uh, and then with what we've got in the premium product, whether it's uh, the, the premium baseball bats, uh, premium baseball gloves, what we're doing from a uh, soccer boot category, uh, we think we've got the uh, the ability to service the beginner, intermediate, and the enthusiast in these uh, the sports that we're focused on. Thanks, Ed. Sure. Our next question comes from Adrian Yi of Barclays. Please go ahead. Good morning, Greg Quarter. Um, my first question is, uh, the, at the beginning of the quarter, there was this notion that it would be a highly promotional quarter. I think the uh, kind of midpoint of the guidance was on sort of a flat promotional environment to the prior year. So I guess I'm curious, outside of Hunt, how did you manage your cold weather categories with the controlled promotional activity? And then my second question is, on the supply chain, how much is direct sourced of your private label? And then as an estimate, sort of on the brand side, sort of indirectly sourced from China. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the ways we were able to manage the promotional environment out there is that we really had differentiated products from uh, many others in the uh, the marketplace between uh, not only our private brands, but uh, whether that be some special makeups we got from the brands and uh, how we assorted our business. We, uh, we we managed our inventory quite well there. Um, we've, we've been able to clear some of that merchandise out. We've also uh, taken some go-forward product that we will have next year some basic product, and we've packed that away so that we didn't go and promote that. We'll buy a run. We're in the process of buying around that next year, um, so that helped the margin rates. And as far as where our brands, what, what the total amount of business that's sourced from the brands overseas, I don't really know. And they're changing factories all the time, and uh, and where they, uh, they they want their supply chain to come from. So I can't answer that uh, that question. Okay. And then just a uh, last follow-up. Um, you talked about uh, quarter-to-date trends or year-to-date trends, being pleased with those. Does that imply, you know, similar to the fourth quarter or higher than, you know, the current Q1 comp guidance? Any color there would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, i I just like to stick with, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're pleased with the results that we've got so far this quarter, um, and, and we're not, not seeing an impact, really, from the coronavirus. Fair enough. Best point. of luck. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from Chris Horvers of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. So I wanted to follow up on the on the gross margin 
you know, if, if we assume, you know, 110% of sales, you're exiting that in half the stores, and then you'd call that a 1,700 base point gap versus the company average from a, from a March margin perspective. The quick math suggests about a 70 basis point annualized benefit, the March margin for this change. Is this in the zip code or are there any assumptions that, you know, we're using here that, that are off base? Um, so I, I, I think you could be heavy on the, on the penetration on the hunt side. There, yeah, that business has come down, you know, quite a bit over the last few years. Right. Got it. Okay. So uh, I guess, um, that understood, given that, you know, your private label continues to grow, the occupancy dollar savings are, have been, you know, really substantial and you still have a lot of renewals coming up and you have the DC, which should, be, you know, relatively small to the annual picture, and then you, you, you do have the mix shift from Hunt. How how could gross margin be flat at the high end? What, what are you assuming are the offsets um, that would, you know, flatten this out for the year? Mm-hmm. So, again, we've got, to, we've got to work through some of this Hunt inventory that we've got in the 400 stores and, you know, in the spring season. So we've got that, in our, we have that in our plans. Um, you know, we did take a charge for it, but the way that works, you only take a char- you only take a charge for the stuff that you sell below cost. But selling at depressed margin rates to move through it above cost, you can't take the charge for. So that's going to hit the P and L over over the course of the you know over the first six months of the year. Um, you know, so that, that's uh, a piece. And we and having these extra two facilities for the first six months of the year is a drag on us. It will be a drag as well. And those are, those are the two main pieces. You know, as we get through last fall. You know, the season last fall wasn't particularly promotional for us. It, we even said Q3 was very lightly promotional. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're, we're not up, you know, we're up against a, a relatively light promotional period in the back half of the year. And similarly, the last part is we've got a, a fair amount of CapEx coming. Um, most of that CapEx is attributable to, to stores coming up and depreciation expense associated with that CapEx whether it be around the golf business, the hunt business, um, Kalia, and so on, uh, most of that depreciation expense uh, it falls into the gross margin line, and that'll that'll hit more heavily in the back half of the year as well. Excellent. Thanks very much. Have a great spring. Thanks. Our next question comes from Joe Feldman of Telsey Advisory Group. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking the question, guys. Good morning. Um, First, one to ask. I think Lauren, you talked about you know doing some work with the selling culture for 2020, yep. and could you maybe talk a little bit more about that and, and what you're thinking to to help improve the selling culture? Yep, um, it's an effort that we did start about a year ago when we rolled out new service standards that really focused on um, engaging athletes and giving confidence for their purchases, um, and we also rolled out last year. Uh, a recognition program that really focused on uh, rewarding people for when they are delivering great service. And this year, we we intend, this is obviously a multi-year journey. We have a lot of opportunity still. Um, so we intend to really redefine several aspects of our service model, specifically women's um, will be redefined, golf will be redefined, um, we're elevating footwear, and we are working on um, training and hiring and coaching um, so that we just keep improving the momentum that we've seen in the stores. Got it. Thanks. And, and then just a, a follow-up. Um, with with such a strong fourth quarter, and it, se- it seems like maybe the, with the warmer weather, you must get a jump on some of these spring sales. Is there a pull forward historically when you have this type of scenario, or or does the, the demand kind of sustain itself through the spring, you know, as kids are out playing baseball and softball and such? It, it, it's hard to tell. You know, we, we actually we, we're very pleased with the start of our of our year, as we indicated. We think some of that could be a pull forward. Um, but uh, it's kind of all baked into our guidance going forward. So we're, we're, we're pleased right now. We don't know what's going to happen with the coronavirus, but uh, as of right now, we're pleased. Great. Thanks. Good luck with this quarter. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve Forbes of Guggenheim Securities. Please go ahead. Good morning. 
maybe maybe just continuing on the uh, the the hunt related I guess liquidation plan, right? Because it sounds it sounds like you plan on selling the inventory uh, through the stores in the spring. So I don't, I don't know if you can either quantify or give us some color on the anticipated um, comp and gross margin impact uh, in the first second quarter, uh, and or maybe if you just want to keep it high level. You know, talk about the decision on you know why why not you know use a third party liquidator or, or you know accelerate the liquidation um, and move up the pace of the resets right as you as you sort of think about what you're seeing uh, in the 135 stores that you've done so far. This is a pretty quick move that we're doing this to you know you've got to sell the inventory down then you've got to you know reallocate the space. Uh, uh, we think this is uh, this is pretty quick. Um, and to use a third party, I don't know why we'd use the, you know, we've got some advice from a third party, but I don't know why we would use a third party when we can liquidate it at a higher price ourselves. We're, we're you know, we're, we're a pretty good retailer. And then may, maybe just a follow-up on that, right? It's still early, early days maybe with us uh, being able to fully, um, you know, appreciate, right, the return profile of this move, right, using out the space allocation changes, but any sort of comment on maybe the payback period um, of the space uh, allocation changes and um, or, or the return profile associated with them? I mean, we're we're pleased with the results. We said the, we went through the peak hunt season in the fall with the removing hunt from 125 stores. We we uh, come positively in those stores. Margin rates were also better in those stores as well. And uh, you know, this is just a move that uh, that. We're looking to make. Uh, I, I don't think it's 100 percent driven by the return on investment from what we're putting in there. We want to, you know, we want to go into categories that, you know, are that that we're committed that we're committed to that are growing, um, and uh, you know, the hunt business is a low return business for us, and we're looking to move on from that. The hunt business is the if you, you, you follow the story, the hunt business is the lowest, probably the lowest turning, lowest margin category we have. As we started to go through this a couple of years ago and started to test this, we felt that we knew that we could make a lot more money, turn the inventory faster, at a higher margin than what we can do from the gun standpoint. I think we indicated that the uh, that the hunt business was roughly 13 or 1,400 basis points below the, uh, the company average. Um, it, it was 1,700 basis points below the... Uh, the company average, and we've indicated that the hunt business has been uh, has declined significantly over the last couple of years. It declined significantly in the fourth quarter, and we still printed a 5.3 percent comp gain. Um, so it's pretty clear that this is the right decision to make. Thank you. Sure. Our next question comes from Seth Sigman of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question and good morning. Um, I want to first start with the supply chain risk that you highlighted potentially into the second quarter. Um, I guess the low end of the comps range considers that. I realize you're not seeing it yet, but in that scenario, based on what you know about how the inventory flows and how the imports flow, would that impact be isolated to the second quarter or would you expect to see some lingering effect into the back half? So I mean, we saw with our with our own private brands the slowdown of shipments in coming out of China in in February, and we've seen that pick up uh, pretty meaningfully here in early March. So we think that you know as we uh, you know as we get to the latter part of April, you know some of the um, the receipt levels will be down in our stores. We don't think it'll be significant, and that's on our private brands. With regard to our national brands, we've we've heard from most of the major national brands that they don't see a significant impact. That there's some isolated impacts along the way, but they don't see significant impacts to the, to their supply chains. Um, so, it, you know, we think that they, there could be a little bit of an impact going into uh, Q2, just because we 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 have visibility to some slowdowns in shipments in February. Um, but you know, it seems to be the our suppliers seem to be coming back online uh, pretty quickly, and I would expect that our, with our brands, the suppliers are coming back online pretty quickly there as well. So I, I don't see a long-term uh, impact in supply chain, um, I, you know, at this point. So I think that's about all we can say. We're not hearing much from the brands that they, that they we do not they're not indicating that there's a meaningful issue out there with their supply chains. 
Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And then just back on the demand backdrop, obviously you're pleased with what you're seeing so far in the year. You're not assuming there's going to be a demand issue. Um, I guess the question is, if you look back to past case studies when there was some sort of level of uncertainty for the consumer like this, and maybe we've never really seen anything quite like this, but is there something that gives you confidence when you look back historically that, I guess, demand won't drop off at some point over the next couple of weeks or months, just given the uncertainty that's out there? Thanks. We really have no, like everyone else, we really have no idea. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this and, uh, um, in a very, very long time. So, you know, we're like everybody else. We're, uh, we're, we're hoping for the best, but we know that uh, it's very uncertain out there and we can't predict what's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Our next question comes from Warren Chang of Evercore. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, your offerings at both the premium end and the value end of the spectrum have really gotten a lot better over the last couple of years. Uh, first, are, there, are these sales going to existing customers, or are you seeing new customers come in as a result of uh, the expanded offering? And then second, following up on Simon's question, how much of a gross margin lift are you getting at the company level as you flip some of the prior Reebok apparel to GSG? So on the first question uh, regarding new or existing customers, a lot of our strategies actually are either bringing in new customers or adding an occasion to current customers. Um, both things are happening. In the case of some of the higher-end assortment, we, uh, we think we're getting back uh, customers that perhaps were going elsewhere. Uh, in the opening price point product, we, we did feel that there were gaps in our, um, you know, consumers were coming in and perhaps filling that need at other competitive channels. So um, it's, it's really both, and it's, it's been effective uh, from both perspectives. Um, the second part of the question? Differentiation and margin rates between DSG and, and Reebok. The DSG margin, margin rate we expect will be uh, a little bit better. We're putting a bit better quality in that product, but there's no royalty payment associated with it. So there's a, a bit of an offset there, and we've uh, – one of the reasons why we think this has done so well is we've we've built better product and taken some of that royalty payment and put it into the uh, into the better product into the marketing of it. So uh, we couldn't be happier with uh, with how the team executed and brought to market the DSG brand. Thanks, that's that's helpful. And my follow up was uh, just on a question on ecom. Can you talk about the trend you're seeing in basket uh, online as you've improved your website and shipping speed? Um, that is not a level of detail that we typically provide, um, but I can just tell you that the e-commerce channel is uh, is doing great across all, all metrics. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Nagel of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. So most of my questions have been asked, but a couple, I guess maybe just follow-ups. Um, first, with regard to the weather, in 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 uh, the fourth quarter, particularly the um, you know, the, the warmer temperatures. I mean, on balance, w was that? Do you think that was more of a positive or negative? No, for, for <laughs> no, no, definitely no. not. No, it was not a positive. Okay, so it was not a positive. Okay, that okay, was good. more of a negative. negative. That's good to hear that. Then the second question, and, I, and again, recognizing that you know, the coronavirus crisis is, is extraordinarily um, fluid at this point, but, you know, there has been some talk about this, uh, the, the crisis leading to the, the postponement or even, uh, I guess, postponement of the Olympics. To what extent, and some of your vendor partners have talked about this as a potential disruption, to, to, to what extent, as you look through 2020s, is the, are, are the Olympics expected to be a driver of your business? Um, is there anything in your guidance, and, and how, how, would you, how, how would you see it, uh, uh, any type of uh, disruption in the Olympics affecting your business? There's nothing in our guidance about the Olympics, and the Olympics, uh, surprisingly, is not a big part of our business. You know, there's some, you know, it's, it's a little bit accretive, but if we have the Olympics or don't have the Olympics, you won't see it in our results. Um, actually, and I've talked about this before, the World Cup has, has more of an impact on our business than the Olympics does. If this was the World Cup year and uh, and weren't having the, the, the World Cup was going to be canceled, that would be a bigger impact to our business than the Olympics. Got it. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. Sure.
Our next question comes from Scott Ciccarelli of RBC. Please go ahead. Good morning, guys. Scott Ciccarelli. Um, so given the, let's call it, 22% increase in inventory kind of per square foot, how much do you feel you, you've benefited from on, on the top line from those higher inventory levels? And secondly, or related to that, I guess, you know, what categories is that extra inventory really concentrated in at this point? Thanks. I think it had a, a significant impact on our uh, on our sales, and it was uh, it was focused in what we characterized as the attack categories going forward, which was uh, you know athletic apparel, athletic footwear, baseball, and golf. And due to the weather trends we had in Q4, those categories uh, were favorably were favorably impacted. Being in a better inventory position, you know, helps us in those. Also helped with but the I, stock I guess, and just a better brand presentation in the stores. Yeah, that that all makes sense. I, I guess what my question would be is if you're expecting inventory levels to kind of moderate as we move through calendar 2020. What kind of negative impact do we potentially see? Because obviously you had a big surge in inventory kind of throughout the course of the year, and then you, as you guys just talked about, it obviously helps sales. But as that growth rate of the inventory starts to moderate, I guess I'm wondering, you know, what what, what kind of potential adverse impact could we see on, on the sales as we move through 2020? We don't see we don't see any real impact there. We think we got back to appropriate inventory levels. We were very clear. Um, um, last year and uh, toward the end of the previous year that we let our inventories get too low. And we got ourselves back to the appropriate inventory levels where we could service the athlete, whether that was a baseball player, softball player, you know, golfer, runner, and uh, we got back to appropriate levels to be able to service them. So uh, we don't see any, we don't see any meaningful difference in our and uh, from what we've done from a guidance standpoint based on moderating our inventory. We think it's appropriate to moderate our inventory from a, uh, a cash position, uh, inventory turnover, margin rates going forward. Um, we're very pleased with what we did. We feel that we'll moderate these through the year, and it'll have no impact on our uh, on our sales. Right. We still see a lot of opportunities internally as we look at, you know, ways to make the inventory more productive. So even as the inventory levels off, we think we can continue to drive positive comps. Got it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sure. Our next question comes from Sam Poser of Susquehanna. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Sorry. Uh, this is Will on for Sam. Um, just a, a, a quick question um, on private brand. How much? Uh, how much is, does that comp, uh, comp? How much of that does it make up of your total revenue now? Private brands business. And around around 14%. Uh, and then, and then on switching topics, what um, what does the tariff impact look like uh, for for FY20 for you guys on gross margin? You know, we've been able to uh, kind of negotiate our way through a lot of these tariffs, and the overall you know tariff impact on us on our costs has been pretty modest. Um, and we, we don't see it having a meaningful impact on our gross margin rates for next year. And then, and then, last one. So, how much? How much? I, I know we've, you guys have, have talked a, a bunch about this, but how much of that inventory? Uh, how much of your inventory now is is comprised of uh, hunt and, um, and and cold weather? Hunt and cold. I mean, we, we've gotten to that granular. Disclosure, um, but I mean our hunt inventory has continued to come down every every quarter for the last eight quarters. Uh, our hunt, our, our outerwear, our cold weather inventory is higher than it was last year because we decided to pack up a fair amount of the go forward merchandise. So merchandise we're going to buy again: black gloves, black ski pants, certain jackets that are going to go forward that are not that uh, are not going to go out of style from a style standpoint or color standpoint. We uh, we've packed those up and we're buying around those next year. So uh, some of our receipts will be down in those categories next year. Thank you. That's all for me. Good luck. Sure. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tom Nickich of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so I want to ask. You know, you're obviously um, pulling Hunt out of 
the, the vast majority of your stores, uh, Ed, I think you said, uh, by the time this is done, you'll only have Hunt in about 12% of your stores. Um, you know, I'm you know, just kind of curious, like, what are those 12% of stores just places where, you know, Hunt is so important, like, you have to, you know, keep it in there, or, you know, why why not just kind of exit the uh, the category completely? Well, there are they're, 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 uh, areas, um, there are stores in more rural areas where hunting is a uh, is an important part of, of people's lives to feed themselves, if you will. Um, it's, uh, you know, they, they, they hunt not just for sport, but they hunt to actually feed their families. And uh, as we've taken a look at that, and uh, we think that that's important to continue to provide that. And that it's going to be just primarily hunting product is all that we're uh, – we're going to be carrying there. Understood. Um, and Lee, a uh, you know, quick question for you: the uh, the capex is uh, moving up this year, uh, you know, higher than what you've seen the last couple of years. Um, is this kind of a you know a, a sort of one-time uh, investment year, or you know, would you say that this uh, you know three hundred thirty or three hundred ninety million on a gross basis is kind of the uh, a, a normalized capex rate? Well, we're, we have an elevated level of investment in our stores this year, and um, yeah, and you know, and, and the stores we're investing in, you know, our golf departments, our, our women's business, transitioning our hunt department. So I, I'd, I'd expect that this year's level of investment in stores is higher than what we'll have going forward. Um, and we don't see, at, you know, at this point, you know, looking out to the next couple of years, any. Uh, significant needs for fulfillment operations next couple of years. So I, I would expect this year to be elevated somewhat over what we've got for the next year or two after that. All right. That's helpful. Uh, thanks, and that's a lot this year. Our next question comes from Paul Lejeuze of City Research. Please go ahead. <clears throat> thanks, guys. i um, curious if you could share the percent of sales that Hunt represents in the 440 additional stores where you'll be removing that category, and how does that compare to what Hunt represented as a percent of sales in the original uh, group of stores where the categories were already removed? So we're not going to get to that level of granularity as we indicated earlier, but I can tell you that it is meaningfully less than it was a year ago, which was meaningfully less than it was the year before. So this is getting to be a, a much smaller uh, part of our overall mix. And as we indicated in all the stores that we've taken out, they've continued to comp positively. Got it. And then and just given your your confidence uh, in, in your ability to replace those those sales with, with new categories, do you actually view removing Hunt as a headwind to comps? Is it, is it neutral? Is it is it a tailwind? Any, any quantification you can provide there? Yeah, I would say for this year it's a slight um, headwind to comps. However, from an earnings perspective, we think we can, you know, we believe that we can cover the majority of that or nearly all of it. The issue is timing uh, in that, um, you know, we're going through the transition in the spring when the hunt is hunt business is low, and then, you know, the transition will happen in the fall where hunt is high. So there's a little bit of an impact on earnings and sales for this year, which are both embedded within our guidance. But if you if you take a full year if you take a full year when we're done with the, all of this it would be accretive to uh, mm -hmm. to accretive to earnings as we go forward. So are you able to make up for the the gross profit dollars completely? Right, if, if it's a little bit of a headwind on comps, um, and you're replacing the higher margin categories or, or gross profit dollars, is it actually higher by the time you're through with this? Yeah, not not for this year, but going forward, yes, we believe we can do that. Because we have to gotcha. we have to clean up the we have to clean up this inventory this year. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Our next question comes from Peter Benedict of Baird. Please go ahead. Oh, hey guys, thanks for taking me in here. Um, just a couple. Firstly, just um, trying to understand kind of the, the outlook for DNA growth as you think about 2020. Um, I think last year was probably up around five percent if you adjust for you know, charges and whatnot, just trying to see with the, with the stepped-up capex, how fast do you think DNA is going to grow um, in 2020? And kind of similar question on the occupancy, which was down almost 2%, I guess, in the fourth quarter. Is that a good run rate as we think about 2020? That, that's my first question. Yeah, I'd say DNA 
uh, probably a slightly faster growth rate in DNA and occupancy. I think you'll see similar uh, similar trends uh, to what you saw to what to what we've had this year. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And then um, I think there was a comment that that there were more items that were going to get added to to the POPUS assortment uh, in in 2020. Can you give us a sense for maybe orders of magnitude um, how much will be available in POPUS? this time a year from now versus today, uh, and then maybe what categories are, are getting added there? Um, we're not going to provide that level of detail, but we are focused on expanding our assortment for Vopis, and some of these inventory investments will actually help with that as we have more confidence that the product is actually in the store and we can light these things up online for people to pick up that day. Um, and we've expanded to Galaxy, and we just are putting a huge focus behind buy online, pick up, and store in general. But we're not we're not going to show the category levels or the growth rates. Okay, fair enough. And then just last question, just on the golf business. I know a few years ago um, there was an investment that was kind of pulled out of the golf business. It sounds like there's a, a little bit more that's going to be put back in. So just maybe Ed, talk to us about kind of your thoughts around golf and 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 you know what you hope to capitalize on here over the next uh, the next couple of years. Well, is the uh, is the golf gal is the golf category has consolidated um, over the last couple of years. Um, we've seen the golf business uh, accelerate. We're pleased with the golf business. We think there's an opportunity there. We think the, the smaller independent golf operators are going to continue to have a difficult time and struggle, so there's an opportunity for market share. We see that golf, we think, is in a really good place right now with the, with the guys on tour. Uh, we think that uh, the brands have brought uh, terrific product cycles to the, the market right now. And uh, with the, the majority of these investments that we're going to be making are going to be in our specialty channel of Golf Galaxy, which we're very pleased with the results we've been getting out of out of Golf Galaxy over the last 18 to 24 months as the uh, as the golf category consolidated. Gotcha. That's helpful. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Our next question comes from Michael Baker of Nomura. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks. Two, please. Uh, two questions. One, can you give us the relative size and opportunity of golf and soccer versus baseball? I know baseball is very high. I know from personal experience, very high ticket uh, for those bats. I don't think there's anything quite like that in soccer, but but perhaps golf there is. Um, so the relative opportunity to replicate what you did in baseball in those two categories. And then uh, a quick one at the end. Um, any impact from the Patriots not winning the Super Bowl, i.e. the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl? Thanks. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to answer the second question. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, uh, from the uh, uh, soccer is not as big as baseball, although there are, there are some big ticket items in soccer that uh, the boots can get very expensive. We've uh, brought in some of the $250, $275 uh, soccer boots that are doing very well. So soccer is not as big as baseball. Golf is bigger than baseball. Um, and uh, if your question was serious about the Patriots and the, uh, the, the Chiefs. A little bit. Uh, I know this was Okay, closure, the uh, New England so side. No. <laughs> yeah, we were very pleased to, to have a new winner of the Super Bowl <laughs> and provide, uh, to provide Super Bowl merchandise to uh, a market that hasn't had it in 50 years. And Kansas City uh, um, supported it very well. They were really excited that they won, and uh, mm -hmm. we were we were pleased with our results. And, and that would be a first quarter event, right? Because the, the, those sales yes. would come after the close of the fourth quarter. Well, Got first quarter, but then leading up to it, uh, it was part in the uh, in the fourth quarter leading up to the Super Bowl, the pre-sales before the before the game. Yeah, I, it wasn't meaningful to the entire quarter comp, and, and won't be. Okay, understood. Thanks for the caller. Appreciate it. Our next question comes from Chris Savizia of Wedbush. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Congrats on the comp. I guess uh, first, just on the comp guidance for a moment, you know, flat up to um, your comments about Q1, you're kind of pleased with how it's running, would assume obviously reasonably positive. I guess what I'm curious about is you go into the back half of the year, you do have some of your more difficult comps that we've seen in some time. So I guess what's your confidence level or how are you thinking about that comp trajectory as you go into the back half of the year? Are there enough for product drivers, initiatives to still drive positive comp in the back half, or are you thinking closer to flattish 
given some of the unknowns. Just curious how you how you're thinking about that. Well, we we haven't we, we're not given quarterly guidance, but uh, I think at least uh, we're the first half is going to be we're not going to tell you anything you don't already know. The first half is going to be easier than the second half, but I so I'm, I'm not going to go out and say that we're going to have comps in every quarter, but um, we're very confident with our overall guidance. Okay. Um, I guess follow up on all this, just on the on the SGNA side for a moment. Um, I know that you mentioned that there are some material offsets on intensive comp, et cetera. Where are you making investments still in the business, whether in-store and labor, or you've walked through e-commerce, you've made investments there, you've made uh, investments in fulfillment. Just what are the where are the investment areas on the SGNA side for this year? How should we think about that? Well, we're continuing to invest in um, in store labor. Um, we are, you know, maintaining hours, notwithstanding the fact that uh, there is some pretty meaningful uh, wage rate inflation in stores, which we expect to continue into this year. But we're we're, we're really working hard to maintain that uh, service experience that we have in the stores. Right now, we're continuing to invest in technology as we've transformed, uh, you know, to the agile development methodology that we've got. We've built up our product teams and we're moving quickly to, uh, you know, to further develop our e-commerce business and our in-store experiences from a technology perspective. So there's significant investments um, uh, coming on, you know, in, in those two areas. Um, but we, we do have we do have the tailwind coming from incentive comps offsetted from um, deferred comp plans offsetting that as well. So we still feel good about being able to uh, leverage uh, SG&A expenses here. Okay. Final thing just for me, just I just go back to my first question. I guess let me ask it this way: What are you most encouraged, excited about, whether it's in footwear, apparel, hard lines, as you think about the balance of the year? And you've got a private label initiative, and they have women's. Just where do you feel like there's the biggest opportunity to support comp growth as you move through the year in some of those major categories? We think baseball can still comp. Uh, we're, we're excited about uh, continuing to grow our baseball business. We're very excited about what we're doing from a soccer standpoint. Um, we're, 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 we're positive on the, on the athletic apparel piece, uh, athletic footwear. Um, we're, you know, X what's happening in the world today. We're pretty positive about our business across virtually all categories, with the exception of the hunt business that we are, are exiting. But other than that, we're we're pretty positive across hard lines, apparel, and footwear in our business right now. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Carson Barnes of Consumer Edge. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for the question. Um, I have two, both related to Hunt. Uh, first, it sounds like the decision to remove Hunt was largely margin-related, um, but can you give any more detail on other data that does prove the decision in terms of customer preferences or opportunities in um, existing categories or new categories? Um, and then second, with the Field & Stream uh, brand continuing to be a strong brand for you, is that largely a function of fishing and other categories outside of Hunt, or will you be continuing to carry some hunting clothing and footwear in the stores, uh, just just not firearms. Thanks. In the in in the stores where we're exiting the hunt business, we'll be exiting the hunt apparel also. Um, as far as uh, you know, category. What the, repeat the first question, please. Sure. Just uh, curious if there was any um, additional data other than kind of the margin related data um, that gave you and that, that drove the decision to. Um, the exit hunt, um, any new categories or um, that you'll be yeah, looking it, at. It's just not it's just not margin category. The, the demand for other categories, as we look through this, was very high. So the demand of what we could do in the baseball business, what we can do in the soccer business, you know, uh, we'll take a look next year at what the next sport is that we're going to take a look at. Probably going to be lacrosse. That there's a big demand for product that we aren't able to service these athletes with, uh, with you know, the space allocated to the hunt area. And we, as we took a look at this, there's a sales upside, we believe, and we think there's a margin rate upside to these other categories. And they're growing where the hunt business is not growing. Good, thanks. Sure. Our next question comes from Matt McClintock of Raymond James. 
please go ahead. Hi, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for fitting in. Just one clarification question, Ed. I think you said, and rightfully so, that you, you can't keep track of where your manufacturers or your vendors are manufacturing the product, but for DSG, did you actually talk about where DSG is being manufactured? Thank you. Uh, we've got different places that uh, that DSG is being manufactured, different places that other private brands are being manufactured. Um, we're more tight to China on the hard lines than we are on the soft lines. But, uh, you know, as Lee said, we've seen some factories that uh, we're running behind. They're getting up to capacity right now. Uh, this is a fluid situation. We look at it virtually every single day. But uh, we're, from a supply chain standpoint, we're confident in the guidance that we provided. Thank you very much for that. Sure. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Ed Stack for any closing remarks. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on our fourth quarter call, and we'll look forward to talking to you again in May when we uh, announce our first quarter results. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.